Hey ladies, welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is canning and preserving and making good uses of our kitchen. And I am interviewing Jennifer here today. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right, so we are gonna be talking today about pressure canning, and I'm sure we'll get into all kinds of topics within that. Um, but mm -hmm. to start out, why don't you share with us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and your journey into pressure canning? Because we're going to talk about later that you've written a new book on pressure canning, which is so exciting. So why don't you share us share with us a little bit about that journey? Okay, so I'm uh, a mom of two and a wife, and I live at the very tip top of California in the rural mountains. Uh, it's actually the same town where I grew up. And uh, it is super beautiful, uh, very rural. Not There's no palm trees in this part yep. of California. <laughs> and I grew up on a cattle ranch. And uh, my mom and grandma canned out of necessity when I was a kid. And then as a grown up, fast forward many years, uh, I probably should have been focused on like painting a baby room. But when I was pregnant, I became obsessed with canning healthy food for my future baby to eat. And that first winter when I was big pregnant, I canned probably 100 jars of applesauce, which my daughter did end up eating. But obviously, I didn't think about at the time, oh, it's going to be like six months until she can <laughs> eat anything else. Uh, so uh, that was the beginning of my canning journey. And then uh, after my second child was born, I started my blog and I just started sharing more and more homemade things that. Um, to me, I knew that I knew about, but I knew a lot of people were curious about, and I'm of the generation where a lot of moms of my friends or my peers were at work. And so some of those homemaking skills had been lost. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was in college, I worked at Joanne's Fabrics and that was a great window into that generation of young women who didn't have a mom at home sewing. They were doing great things. They were, they were, uh, you know, doing other things, but that little piece of that, of that homemaking puzzle had been lost. So started my blog and then I started sharing more about canning. And then I had been searching for a master food preserver program, mm. which is a program put forth by your state's cooperative extension office. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I didn't find one local to me, but I did find one in Utah that was willing to let someone come from out of state and I had made friends with a wonderful person on Instagram who now is my good friend in real life. She invited me to stay in her home uh, and come to her master preserver course. I learned tons about pressure canning there. I mean, I learned about freeze drying and can't say enough good things about a master preserver course. Um, and then um, I just started pressure canning more and more. When I was dating my husband, my, my cute boyfriend asked me, well, uh, why don't you learn how to pressure can? That is a really good way to pressure. Or that's a really good way to preserve um, buck meat or venison. So mm -hmm. as a hunter and angler, he was mm -hmm. really interested in that. And for years, that was the only pressure canning I did. It was only at hunting season that I would oh, do it. And by only doing it once a year, I never got comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. I was always starting from scratch. You know, when you've mm -hmm. done one uh, something one time, it's brand new every time. So for years, I did like four or five years, I bet. I was pressure canning just once a year. And then after the Master Preserver course, I felt super comfortable just canning all the time. And that is what led to my book, The Pressure Canning Cookbook. That is so, that's so fun. I always love hearing people's journeys into yeah. discovering kind of some of these older arts um, mm -hmm. that we did have. We've had a couple generations even now that have kind of skipped that skill and we're having right. to kind of recover a lot of these skills, which can be amazing, but they can be really hard to know. Where do I start? How do I right. get into this? So right. I do canning and I get asked a lot about canning. And one thing that I find is mm -hmm. that there's, I mean, there's many different kinds of canning, right? And a lot of people don't realize there's water bath canning, there's pressure canning. We do these, you know, we use these for different things. So why right. don't you tell us, like, what exactly is pressure canning for those of us in the audience who are not mm. familiar with what that is? Okay. So both types of water bath or pressure canning achieve the same result. They're killing all the spoilers inside the jar. They're forcing oxygen out. So it creates a tight seal. Uh, when you are water bath canning, you are relying on the acid in the food recipe. So water mm. bath canning with the black speckled pot 
like grandma used to, that mm-hmm. is appropriate for jams, jellies, pickles, fruits, everything that is just naturally more acidic. Mm. So all those recipes are using acid and the heat of the boiling water to create an environment inside the jar that is inhospitable to spoilers. Um, I, I mean, it's not accurate in a scientific sense, but metaphorically, it's like you're trying to create the surface of Mars inside those jars. There's heat and no way for life to grow. No germies, no mold, no nothing can grow. That's what you're trying to create there. Boiling water only gets to 212 degrees. Mm. So it needs that acid of the apples or raspberries or lemon juice, citric acid, whatever your ingredients are in those low, in those high acid recipes, it, it requires that acid to work together to create that Mars like atmosphere. Okay. If you're pressure, if you're canning something that is lower in acid, it doesn't have that acid helping out create that Mars like atmosphere, then you need a lot more heat. And we achieve mm-hmm. that really high heat at home or low acid foods with a pressure canner. Those low acid foods would be plain vegetables, like plain green beans, plain corn, meats, beans, broth, and so on. Those low acid foods, you need to heat them to over 240 degrees, which is the temperature required to kill all spoilers, including the C. botulinum bacteria, which if given the chance to grow, can create the toxin that can make us really, really sick. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to know any of the things I just said. You don't have to understand any of that or remember any of that. But if you are looking at a recipe for that is specifically for canning, the method will be indicated in the recipe. A tested, Mm -hmm. safe pressure canning recipe is going to be appropriate. And it'll say, this is a pressure canning recipe for ground beef or chili con carne or be- bone broth, right? Mm-hmm. So those are the, the main differences. The pressure canner gets over 240 degrees, which we need mm-hmm. when we don't have the acid of the strawberries or the lemons or the peaches to help us out in making that environment inside the jar, not a place for ger- uh, bacteria can grow. Mm-hmm. That is really helpful. It's a good distinction because a lot of times I will have people say, I think people tend to think of water bath versus pressure canning as just kind of the method that you want to use. (laughs) And they'll say, well, all I want to do is water can. I don't want to deal with a pressure canner. And that's fine, but you're really limited then. You know, you're you're sticking to those jams and jellies. And um, for a long time, I wanted to step into canning. And I thought that sounds really cool, but our family can only use so much jam. And I kind of had a very limited view of what canning could do. And I don't have a lot of extra time. I'm busy. So how can it benefit me? And when we, when I started looking into pressure canning, like you're saying there's the beans and like all this stuff you can do. It was this moment of like, oh, I can help this. Like I can use this to make my meal planning faster to like actually can things that are going to help. And that's when it was like, oh, pressure canning is worth learning. Um, It is. It is. Totally. Yeah. So I would love to know, like, what are your personal favorite things? I know you've, mm-hmm. you've mentioned a few, but what are your favorite things to can, to pressure can? <laughs> so I would never uh, say that, oh, it's, it's, there is so much value. There is so much value in learning water back canning. And mm-hmm. if you are brand new to canning, listening to this, then try it out. It can be so fun. There's yep. many, many great, easy, quick tested recipes that are going to give you a super great result. There's lots of quick wins. Um, water bath candy, you can do lots of smaller batches. Mm -hmm. It's great. And I will, it's never a mistake to have a beautiful jar of jam on your shelf. Like that's a great thing to be able to feed your kids in their lunch boxes for school. No shade on water bath. Yep. However, if you are, you know, a mom and, or just meal planning, thinking through like, what am I going to eat? Like, I think I'm a teacher, right? And so what am I going to eat on my 25 minute lunch break at school? That isn't junk. It's not going to make me, you know what I mean? Like, what can I grab really quick that's good to eat? And I might, I'm one of the moms that would just, oh, I'll just figure it out when I, maybe there's something left in the car. Maybe there's a jerky <laughs> stick that I can grab. You know what I mean? And then I end up yes. not eating anything and feeling terrible yes. by the afternoon. Yeah. So it is a really, really valuable tool for stocking your pantry with foods that are cooked in advance. Mm-hmm. Okay. I could not repeat that enough. It is cooked in advance. Mm-hmm. So when you heat it up, it is already cooked. Your meat cooked through beans, tender, mm-hmm. uh, all your ingredients as nutritious as you 
desire to seek out. They are really, really helpful. So that said, um, I think that one of the best things that you can do is you can can a batch or two or three of a recipe, like your go-to, like the things that the kids will always be happy to eat, the thing that everyone would like, just a quick bowl of chili con carne or a quick, mm. um, uh, my, we just taught a in-person pressure canning class and we did the chicken chili. It's great with veggies on top. It's great with a side salad. It's great by itself. It's great with a mm. heel of bread, a great pantry staple like that. It's going to save your bacon over and over when you're in a time pinch and it's like, well, it's this or scrambled eggs for supper. Cause you know, we had yep. baseball practice that ran late or whatever the case is. I feel like those, those meals in jars are so handy to have. So, so helpful. That said, it's also really helpful to have jars of bone broth canned. And that isn't a quick project. It's not, there's no way to say it. It takes a little time and planning in advance, but certainly isn't difficult. You can prepare trays of bones and leftover vegetable tops and onions and little bits and bobs and roast those and then simmer them in a crock pot or in an instant pot. And then processing those jars just gives you jars of the most flavorful and nutritious base for anything else you want to cook. You cook your rice. The first time I had rice cooked in a homemade bone broth, I was like, "This, oh, how, how is it even... What else is in this? It must be something else. No, it's just magically that good and so nutritious. So it's yeah, and you're you're nutritious. making it out yeah. of bones that you would have otherwise thrown away, and then you have right. the broth so there, which is like amazing. It's essentially free or close yes. to free. Yes, super low cost, so nutritious. I mean, the the amount of traffic I've had on one blog post about bone broth, it's like the world is super stoked about bone broth, right? Yes, it's buying, yes. It, buying it from the store is so expensive. Good, yeah. good quality good bone stuff, broth yeah. is expensive. Yep. And being able to just pull a jar, and I actually, I always cut mine 50-50 with water because it's like, it's so precious and so valuable. Mm -hmm. You don't even need a whole, you don't even need mm -hmm. it to be 100% when you're cooking with it. Mm -hmm. It's just a super, super ingredient to have on hand. You can never cook enough of it. And then I think, so we're going for like, from super practical meals and jars. I think pressure canning is also rad for some few little weird things that you just want to have like small jars as hostess gifts. Um, oh, that's a good idea. So like one recipe that I was like, maybe this will work out. It turned out to be so dang good was mushrooms. So mushrooms can actually mm -hmm. vary well. You would, might think that they would get soft, they don't. They hold up really well. They hold their shape beautifully. They're fast. Mm -hmm. And you can can a little jar of mushrooms with a beautiful woody sprig of rosemary. They look amazing. You can bring that as a gift to an expectant mother, like put this in some soup or put this on a charcuterie board. There are so many things that you might not have thought of that you could pressure can that are really helpful and as well as beautiful and just like an interesting thing to bring as a hostess gift or as an addition to when you're getting together with friends. Super fun ideas like that, I think. Just kind of round out all the different things that you can pressure can. That's really fun. Um, that makes me think. So we have do we do a lot of um like hot sauces, but we mm -hmm. do like fermented. And so they're in yeah. the fridge and they'll last like six months, which is great. But I've thought about getting into canning hot sauces too. Are yeah. there some good recipes for hot sauces? I've never done any pressure canning with yes. hot sauces. <laughs> yes. That's a great thing to look up. I, um, my family, as my kids age, maybe we'll, we'll get more into being able to eat more hot things. Right. But right uh -huh. now they don't eat a whole lot of hot, but there are many good recipes, both water bath and pressure canned recipes that mm. are for hot sauce. Mm -hmm. And as a quick side tip for your audience, if you ever have an idea like that, oh, I wonder if I can get a recipe for Google cooperative extension mm -hmm. and the thing you want a recipe for cooperative extension, raspberry jam canning recipe, mm. cooperative extension, hot sauce canning recipe. And then that will yield results that are tested and safe and are going to give you a good result. The, mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, the internet is full of misinformation and it's really helpful to just weed out the noise mm -hmm. and find something that is trusted. And then mm -hmm. once you find the trusted one, well, then you could compare it to, mm -hmm. you know, the your neighbor down the street's recipe or your grandma's recipe or whatever. Uh, but going off of those is a really smart move. Well, that's good. Let's let's 
Let's do a little aside real fast on safety. We haven't talked about this because, you know, I can be a very creative cook. I get the crock pot out and you just throw things in and every time it turns out different. Uh, But when we're learning canning, we don't want to do that. So let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, you kind of mentioned looking up your extension office, but how do we kind of dip our toes in the water while making sure our food is going to be safe to eat? (laughs) Right, right. Well, I think the biggest thing is... um, well, there's so much to say here. There's just so much <laughs> misinformation out there. Uh, so I'll start with this. The USDA found and announced to America that in 1917, pressure canning was the only safe method of preserving meat into jars, period. Mm. So as far back as 1917, we knew the temperature that is required to kill the bot spore, mm-hmm. which is thermophilic, is 240 degrees. Mm-hmm. And I just read lots and lots of uh, ideas and feelings that are not based on facts that say things like, well, I just boil my low acid recipes for three hours. Or that's not the way my grandma did it. And like, mm-hmm. I don't I don't care what whose grandma did. I don't, I, that makes no difference to me. I don't care. What I care about is a plain old, very boring food science fact that we have known for a really long time that the the bacteria that you really want to kill can only be killed at over 240 degrees. And boiling water, I don't care if it's boiling for three days. It's never getting hotter than 212. Yeah. And furthermore, which I don't know how anyone could argue with this, anything that you boil for three hours is going to be mush. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That doesn't sound appetizing. I don't personally desire to turn my home kitchen into a factory. And some people do. And if you want to, that's fine. You do you. Okay. But I don't personally have that goal of just as fast as I can canning every single thing, putting it into glass jars. I want the things that I pull off the pantry shelf to be good. I want to be happy to serve that to a guest. I'm not interested in the factory mindset. And I think I'd feel like that even if I had three times or four times as many children. I don't see the sense in canning a bunch of stuff badly with seals that'll fail that could be growing the bot spore. Like, I I just don't want to deal with that. That seems really counterintuitive. Yeah. So I think the most important thing for you to know is like we said in the beginning, those low acid recipes that have beans, meat, um, and plain vegetables, those are appropriate for a pressure canner. And don't let anyone tell you this rural legend of, oh, I knew somebody in their pressure canner blew up. People love to say that. And then as soon as Uh I ask, Tell me more about that. Invariably, the answer is, oh, someone took the lid off too soon. Uh-huh. Okay, So that would happen with an Instant Pot. If you were able to nope. open the lid before it had it depressurized, the lid would blow up too. Okay. So another thing I can share is the importance of following the directions, regardless of what kind of canning you're doing. If you follow the water bath canning instructions that came with your pot, that you get from a cooperative extension office, that you get from the ball canning website, freshpreserving.com, that you get from anybody worth their salts information, you're going to have no problems, right? Very few issues. The worst thing that will happen is like, maybe your jam will be too soft, right? It'll still be safe to eat. And then you have syrup for your pancakes. Yeah. But just going rogue and like, I think I'm just going to do what I, you know, just going off of some imagined set of instructions is the worst thing you can do. Follow the instructions that come with your pressure canner and you will have a great result. Every pressure canner that you purchase now or that you can get uh, the manual for online has many recipes that are tested. It's going to tell you exactly what to do every step of the way. You don't even have to think independently the way when you're cooking your crock pot meal, you have to think through like, okay. So how long is it going to take for the meat to get tender? Then do I add the potatoes? You're making decisions that whole time. When you're pressure canning, if you just follow the directions, you don't have any decisions to make. You just follow the directions. Yeah. That's really helpful. I hope it's helpful. (laughs) Yes. Well, and that's why, like, personally, when I was learning how to can, so first thing I did was water bath canning, started Mm -hmm. with jam, because I'm like, I can do this. This is easy. And I got, uh, Pomona Pectin has a cookbook of their, it's my favorite one for jams and jellies. Yeah. And they have a cookbook. I bought it, even though their recipes are on their website, because the whole first part is how to do it. It's all of the instructions. I could sit with like the book in front of me, read through, and it just felt way less overwhelming than trying to sift through everything online. And it's right there. I can read through start to finish, and then I can flip back and forth when I get confused. And I think, especially with canning, that's just another step above of having to follow the instructions, 
having something like that is really, really helpful. And then it's not scary. You go through the steps and the book's telling you what to do. Like you said, it doesn't feel as scary or overwhelming. And, um, and then you, you, you learn it more and then you, you know, each time you get better and better and it becomes Mm -hmm. less scary. But the first time you do it, you kind of just gotta, you gotta dive in and take it on. And then you're like, Oh, that wasn't as bad as I thought. I always encourage people to bring a friend, like invite your girlfriend over. Hopefully your kids can play together or have a, like phone a friend, have a friend join you. It makes the work go by faster. It's like you guys can chat while everything's happening inside the jars. It's, It's a really great thing to do with a friend. And it's fun if you're learning together and or you might even be leading the charge, but it's, it's fun to do in a, in a duo or trio for sure. Yeah, I like that. And then it's going to make you, it has a, there's a, a date on the calendar. It's going to yeah. make you do it. Yes. <laughs> Dive in. Okay. So what I wanted to ask about personally is <clears throat> with pressure canning, I've only ever done individual things. You know, you do green beans and, oh, you know, things yeah. like that. But what I really want to dive into, this is what I've got your cookbook and I'm ready to do it is okay. entire meals. So getting yeah. those meals in jars, because as a busy mom, that is so helpful. So right. can you walk us through a little bit? Like, what does it look like? You're going to make soup or whatever you have kind yeah. of talked about. What do you cook it and then can it? Like, what does that kind of look like? Yeah. So the very short answer is you cook it most of the way through and then you can it. Okay. So backing up, when I sat down to write this book, I went through, I made a big stack on the dining table of all the cookbooks I normally refer to with recipes my family already liked or Mm -hmm. recipes I had wanted to try or, and then I went through and I had to work backwards. Like, does this recipe have like a key ingredient that is not safe for canning? Mm -hmm. Quick side note, there are some ingredients that aren't safe for pressure canning. It's a bummer, but you can always add them at the reheat, mainly dairy and grains. So I know Mm -hmm. it's the pits, like there's a tomato soup recipe in my book. You just add the cream when you're warming it up in the saucepan. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. There's no way around it. The proteins and dairy that we love so much, it prohibits even heat penetration. Sorry. And like noodles, you can't do noodles, right? Yeah, no. I've toyed around with making a chicken soup recipe where it was like you would add the the noodles at the end and it just was like chicken with broth. And I just, I ended up not (laughs) including it because it was like. (laughs) There just wasn't enough of a recipe. You know what I mean? It wasn't Mm -hmm. enough of a recipe really. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So no noodles, no grains, Mm -hmm. um, and no dairy, which is, I get it. It's the pit. I love cheese and dairy as much Mm -hmm. as the next gal. Um, so backing back up to my recipe list, I just had to work through and go backwards from the recipes and think, okay, so are all these, most of these ingredients on this list safe for pressure canning? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. And if so, what do I need to do to this recipe to make it safe for pressure canning so that the bites of the chunks of meat are all uniform in size and small enough for heat to penetrate? And then same with the vegetable chunks. And then what time of what time do I put in the recipe for how long it should be cook canned for based on the pressure canning time for the ingredient and the recipe that needed the longest time? So I had to work backwards like that. And then, of course, test it and take pictures. And that was a whole project. Mm-hmm. But what I would do is I would make a double batch. And then the first, like one half, my family would eat for supper that night. And then mm-hmm. the rest that would be canning. So oh, that, I mean, idea. I'm just, it's not like I have a team of people. I'm just a normal yeah. mom with, you know, like a dog to feed and stuff. I got stuff to do. Uh-huh. I don't have time to be doing a whole lot extra. So that is how we, that's how I did it. So the short answer is you cook it first and then you can it. So okay. you'll hear in the pressure canning world about a thing called raw pack or oh, hot yep. pack. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there is nothing unsafe about raw packing. And that means you put raw chunks of meat into jars and canning it. There's nothing wrong with that. Do it all day long if you want to. That's great. Uh, At the Master Preserver course, we did a taste test of Mm -hmm. a bunch of different recipes that had raw packed meat versus hot packed meat. Mm -hmm. And the it was unbelievable how much better the hot pack was. And I can't encourage you enough to try out hot pack when you are, especially when you're doing meat and or recipes that are already Mm -hmm. cooked or recipes, a whole meal in the jar. Uh, Hot packing means that you brown your pieces of meat before you can them. That's all it means. So they're not necessarily cooked all the way through. Like your chicken will still be pink in the middle. It won't be fork tender. Um, Same with your uh, red meat, but it just keeps its shape so much better it gives so much better flavor. You can brown it in bacon grease or oil or butter. Don't use a ton of fat because fat is the enemy of a good seal, right? We don't want to have a lot of fat in the jars. 
But hot packing, I'm telling you, it is worth the extra time. And if you do it the way I did it, where you're just making a batch and then feeding, like make a double batch and feed that for your supper, it's mm -hmm. it's not any extra time at all. It yeah. is way, way, way more delicious. And it looks like something you want to eat. It looks, it looks mm -hmm. like the version that isn't canned. Which well, that's really I, interesting because it, be it makes it makes sense the way you say that you're browning it. Like, obviously that's going to lock in the, you yeah. know, all the taste, but just from hearing raw pack versus hot pack, you would assume raw pack then like, it's not cooking as much, like it'll be less mushy or, it'll be, you know, you almost think that that's actually going to be the more flavorful oh, yeah. way. So that, yeah. that makes sense. And that's a really good tip when you're looking at recipes and how to do it. Yeah. Um, I love that. And it's also goes back to the idea of, is my kitchen a factory or not? If, mm. Like if your kitchen's a factory, like if, if you have like 40 broiler chickens and you're butchering today, mm -hmm. go ahead and raw pack. I am not yeah. going to sh have shade on any mama that's, you know, yeah. raw packing all that chicken. Great. Do it. But if you are just canning like two or three batches this weekend, mm -hmm. take the time to hot pack because I'm telling you that the, the results are so good. Mm -hmm. It's so delicious. And it's so much so that. I mean, I wouldn't say my kids are super picky, but they are, I would say, normal picky. Uh -huh. They won't even, they don't even know that it's been canned. Yeah, that's so good to know. Okay, it's just so really delicious. if you can think off the top of your head, thinking about yeah. the the meals that you have mm -hmm. in your cookbook, which one's your favorite? So one that turned out really great was that I, I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out was the Portuguese pork Vina Diallos. Oh, my family have it right here. My, Great. My husband's family immigrated from Portugal uh, in the 1940s. And since I've been with my husband, he his family has said, oh, Grandma Mary, she used to make Vinny Darlis. And their version of Vinny Darlis was fermented in a crock on the countertop, which is a whole nother beast that is amazing. Yes. And I still would love to try that and make it. And this is not that. But it is a can, a pressure canned version of Portuguese vina de Alos, which is wine and pork together. So there's that apple cider really vinegar good. and wine, and it is very tender, very tasty. Turned out really, really great. Um, another recipe that I really like is my Graham's hamburger soup. Which, oh, that sounds good. So it's hamburger as in made with ground beef. My mm -hmm. grandma uh, was the quintessential rancher's wife. She would make big pots of stew or soup to take out to the ranchers uh, who were working cattle, sometimes in the cold, and like everybody would ladle up a big bowl. Um, and it's just is a very good, it's an inexpec inexpensive, homey, mm -hmm. hot soup. Um, her, it's not our secret ingredient, but she always would insist, use tomato paste, not the canned mm -hmm. tomatoes. And it's just, it's a really good hot soup that I think lots of people would really enjoy. Yeah, I think my kids would like that. That would be such a handy one to have just in your pantry. You can crack open a jar yep. and have dinner yeah. ready. Like that's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it, that's why like TV dinners and frozen meals, that's why that's why women were buying them. That we need yeah. something fast, easy, immediately. Right. Yeah. Like there's no there's no shade on needing that immediacy. Yeah. But it does it, to pressure can it just takes a little bit of extra thinking ahead and especially if you do it at the same time that you're cooking supper one night i'm telling you that is the hot ticket yeah one like i will do that a lot with freezer meals like i'll mm -hmm. if i'm making lasagna i will always totally. do two put one in the freezer but totally. we run out of freezer space in like 10 seconds there's never right. extra and we have a whole standing freezer and you know it's like there's right. never extra room but when you right. can get stuff that doesn't require your refrigerator or freezer space it can just be in the pantry it is mm -hmm. amazing and you don't realize actually how convenient that convenient it is until you just pull it out of the, out of the cupboard <laughs> So that's bears mentioning that pressure canned food that is canned correctly has a shelf life that is indefinite, which means mm -hmm. many, many years. So if you, especially if you can, I know not everybody's pantry is set up like this, like this, but if you can keep your jars in a cool, dark spot, it doesn't have to be cold, but just light breaks down your potatoes and it, it makes things a little bit more mushy over time. It's really terrible on your canned peaches, which are water bath canned. But mm -hmm. if you can keep them in the dark and keep it cool, they will last indefinitely. So it doesn't eat yeah, up that awesome. freezer, that that yeah. super valuable freezer space. If no matter how big your freezer is, it's finite and it's dependent on your power not going out, which is yeah. like just a thing to manage, thing to think about. Um, I I still use my chest freezer, right? I still I still freeze things. 
Um, if if uh, you have listeners that are like super, super into food preservation, I think it also bears mentioning that the way to preserve all the things, like everything is freeze drying and you need to make an investment in a freeze dryer yes. because that it, there's, there's many things that you can't pressure can, yeah. right? But you can freeze dry nearly everything. Yeah. Do you so have a freeze dryer? Get, I don't, but I'm getting a, an addition to my house right now. I, uh, if I wasn't blurred out, you'd be able to see there's but like plywood behind me. And <laughs> um, it's definitely on my mind that that would, I would really get a bit, lot of enjoyment out of it. And I have two friends I want that have one. one. I want one so bad. Like it is on my like five-year plan. Like I want yeah. one. <laughs> it's a huge, it's a huge investment. They're yeah. kind of big. Like it's as yep. big as a washing machine. However, that if, if, if you have listeners who are thinking, I want to preserve all the things. Okay. Canning is a super awesome tool. It's my favorite. I love it. I love teaching people how to do it, but you can't can milk, right? Yeah. You can't, can't you, cheese, the milk. There's many, many things that don't can well. And if you're serious, serious about preserving all the things, invest in a freezer and get the biggest one you can yeah. afford. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. As we're rounding out, I'm going to have you tell us about your book in a minute, but I want to okay. real fast, if someone's listening to this and they're like, Oh, having meals in the pantry, that all sounds great, yeah. but I don't know how to pressure can. What are your tips for getting started? How does someone start to dip their toes and um, mm -hmm. into this world? Well, you need a pressure canner that is something that you can trust. I would warmly recommend one of two brands, Presto or All American. Mm -hmm. Presto is a trustworthy, high quality uh, canner. I have the 16 quart, which is their smallest size. Mm -hmm. uh, and the price point matches that, right? It is made in mm -hmm. China and it's smaller. So it was like a hundred and it was on sale the other day on Amazon for $108. Oh, so wow, the, that's the great. entry level yeah. price is, is is affordable. It's smaller for the for the cupboard storage. Love mine. I have had mine for seven years. Have had no trouble. Yep. All American is made in America. It has many sizes. They come in six colors. If you want a color, oh, that's fun. Uh, and their price point matches that. Like a, mm -hmm. a mid size one is like four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's a bigger investment. It's a bigger yeah. pot, but they're excellent. I mean, they, you truly will hand it down to your granddaughters, right? Yeah. right. Or grandchildren. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you need a canner. I love a thrift as much as the next gal. And if you are thrifting or at a garage sale or getting one from your mother-in-law's garage or something, you need to do a quick Google and see if you can get the manual for that canner. If you mm -hmm. can't get a manual, I would move on. I would, I would spend your money on getting one used or not that has a manual. Mm -hmm. You can get the pressure gauge checked by a cooperative extension office. And if you don't have one near you or can't find one, your local tire shop will oh, probably be very, well, they better be willing to test <laughs> it for you because you're going to remember that when it comes time to get your winter tires, right? Mm -hmm. So they can test just to make sure that the dial, if it says 12 pounds of pressure, it really is 12 pounds. That's what That's you're testing. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're going to get a pressure canner. You're going to get a friend to join you on this journey. You need jars. They can be used uh, or they can be brand new. You need new canning lids and you're going to follow a test, a tested recipe from mm -hmm. a cooperative extension office or from a cookbook you trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's perfect. That's the five steps that you need. Okay. Great. So, um, why don't you tell us you've got your new cookbook? It did it just come out like this month? The pressure canning cookbook came out on the 2nd of April. So like oh my a gosh. week ago, yes. one week ago, it's one week old. That's so exciting. So I've got it here. Yeah. The pressure canning cookbook, step-by-step -step recipes for pantry staples, gut healing broths, meat, fish, and more. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, it is a great cookbook for a brand new beginner. I mentioned I'm an English teacher. So I tried really hard to write super clear instructions for how to get yeah. started if you're a brand new beginner. Um, I think one thing that you might not have flipped to is at the very back, I have a page that shares with you uh, if you've never canned before, here's a few recipes to try in order on page 135. If you've canned a few helpful. times, there's a few recipes to try out that are medium in terms of challenge level. And then if you're an intermediate canner, like you've canned, try making, uh, you know, these three or four recipes in order. So oh, yeah. I just tried to think as a teacher, what can I bring to the pressure canning space that isn't already in every other book? that will help a newbie get started or really help an intermediate person take it to the next level. Yeah, so that's I really it's, helpful. It's a great book for beginners. And there are a lot of recipes that are both like plain vegetables, plain meat, plain whatever, but also quite a few recipes that are a thing that you could open up 
and heat up for supper or lunch. Yeah. That's so helpful. When you've got, let's see, <clears throat> you have like 30 pages at the beginning of directions, directions <laughs> and yeah. how to pressure can and, um, the essential parts of a pressure canner, all that stuff that if you're thinking, okay, this is fun, but I don't know how to get started. Yeah. This is going to help you. You can get the book. You can sit down, read it through, gather right. your supplies and try that first recipe, which is, I, I love that. Right. I, the very first quote unquote recipe in the book is plain water. Uh -huh. So I really do try and speak to, to the, to the reader that might be very fearful. If uh -huh. you are really unsure what to do, start with plain water. And then you can have a few jars on hand for when the power goes out or yep. emergency preparedness. And yeah, I, I just think it's really, really especially good for a beginner, but it's great for an intermediate canner as well. And it yeah. is available anywhere books are sold. And if you get it and love it, I'd love it if you'd leave it a review. It helps other canners, other beginners find the book. Awesome. And then you're on Instagram as well. What is your Instagram handle? I'm at the Domestic Wildflower, and I also host a food preservation podcast called Perfectly Preserved. So I'd love for oh, you guys fun. to listen to that too. It's fun. Yeah. Super That's great. Awesome. Good. Well, we'll put all the links for everything uh, in the show notes for this. And um, thank you, Jennifer. This was so fun. I am, I've been talking for a year about doing these meals in jars, Yay! and I keep dragging my feet. So when I saw this cookbook, I was like, yes, okay, I've got this. Like, <laughs> I've got recipes. I'm going to finally do this. So thank you for sharing all this. Um, it was awesome. Thank you so much for having me.